Over the next hour, you have the opportunity to engage our company grade uh, leaders with questions on uh, leadership at the company grade level and below and expectations as a new platoon leader once you arrive to your company. The intent of today's panel is to learn from our panel's experiences and to better prepare yourself for your job as a future Army leader. Ground rules for today's panel, pretty simple. Um, you can ask a question of a specific panel member or you may ask as a panel as a whole. Uh, if you do have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, at this time, I'll allow each of the panel members to introduce themselves, a uh, brief, brief background about their Army experience and leadership experience. Should be on. All right, I'm Captain Cummings. Uh, I'm a 2010 graduate at West Point, uh, infantry officer. I uh, spent most of my time in light infantry units uh, in 101st and 10th Mountain, uh, with my last experience being uh, as a company commander for 24 months with the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, I've had experience on brigade and, and battalion staffs as well. Uh, I appreciate you guys being here uh, and I uh, look forward to your questions. I'm Captain Kristen Holcomb. I'm also a 2010 graduate of West Point. Uh, graduated from there and went to flight school where I was qualified in the OH-58 Delta Kyle Warrior, which is no longer in the Army inventory, unfortunately. Um, I served as a platoon leader and uh, an assistant operations officer in the 82nd, uh, deployed with them to Afghanistan, and then was selected for the 160th where I became qualified in the MH-6M Little Bird. Served there as a platoon leader, company commander, and uh, company operations officer. I am now a tactical officer at West Point, um, which is essentially kind of like a PMS for you guys. Um, and I'm here with 12 West, West Point cadets. Hopefully they are um, spreading the good word from West Point and behaving. <laughs> uh, Captain Chantel Glass, I currently work at Florida International University. Um, I am an engineer, so I did my platoon leader time in the 82nd. Uh, worked 8th Army Engineer Staff um, in Korea, uh, commanded for 31 months in uh, armored battalion and over in the engineers, and now I'm enjoying this time teaching and just finished up my second master, so having fun. Hey, what's going on, team? Uh, Natty Kasim, I'm a uh, West Point 2010 grad MI officer from Houston, Texas, and I spent my lieutenant time at Fort Riley where I deployed to Afghanistan and I held a platoon leader XO job as well as intel job at the brigade level. And then my captain time in Germany where I was a uh, battalion S2 and then a company commander for a headquarters company uh, with 2nd Cavalry Regiment focusing on the Eastern European front. Uh, now currently with MIT's ROTC program uh, teaching group four the Honey Badgers. What's up, team? There we go. Um, and super excited to be here and share some of our experiences. Uh, on the personal side, I'm married two years. Uh, I have uh, two older brothers and a younger sister and uh, amazing parents that all live in Texas right now. So um, looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. All right. So Captain Gregory Ingram, um, 09 North Georgia graduate. I uh, did my Tune leader time in Germany, Bamberg, Germany. Um, also did battalion staff out there. Um, deployed to Afghanistan as well uh, with the 240th Quartermaster Company. Um, company command time at Fort Hood, Texas. I was a transportation company commander. Did some division level staff time there and currently at Missouri Western State University, about 45 minutes from here as an APMS. I'll just ask it. Good afternoon, Cadet Sentinel, Middle Tennessee State University. This is a question for the entire panel. What are some common pitfalls of new lieutenants and how can we prevent those from happening? I'll start. Go for it. <laughs> uh, I think uh, emotion is one of the big pitfalls of uh, new lieutenants, okay? You guys are all most likely type A personalities who are used to having success. Uh, I was the same way when I was a new second lieutenant. I became attached to my plans, I became attached to um, the things that I briefed and would show that emotion when someone told me, uh, go back and do it again. 
so I would say the biggest thing is you need to control your emotions. You need to be the mature officer uh, to show everyone else that you have the outward confidence and competence so that when you do brief something and t someone tells you that it's wrong or you do have to, you're on staff and you have to do things 12 to 15 times until you get it right, that it doesn't impact your work ethic or your overall uh, demeanor, okay? Uh, so again, the biggest thing is, is don't show your emotion, okay? Uh, you know, there might be times where you need to, you know, give people an emotional response to motivate them or get them to do what you want, but at the same time, uh, those, those negative type emotional reactions uh, can have uh, quite an impact, especially when dealing with senior leaders. I've got one for the uh, folks who branched aviation in the room. This is something that I didn't know leaving West Point. Um, I learned about the infantry rifle platoon and squad at West Point. I didn't learn about the aviation platoon, which isn't really a thing as it turns out. Um, so I, I think a common pitfall of aviation lieutenants is to think that they are going to go be in charge of a platoon. Um, in actuality, you're going to go learn a lot. You're going to sit at the bottom of the totem pole um, when it comes to progressing in your airframe. You're going to be expected to learn as quickly as your warrant officer peers while also trying to learn how to do the commissioned officer work of the aviation branch. Um, the guy that replaced me uh, showed up and wanted to counsel and lead and take charge of everyone and everything, and, and that wasn't very effective. He was working with uh, you know, a platoon slash company full of warrant officers who had 10 to 15 years more life and army experience than he did, and it, it just it didn't fit. So it's understanding who you are, how you fit in, um, and where you do or do not need to speak up uh, in, in a certain, in a particular circumstance. Uh, I would say what I would add to it, just being humble. Once you make it to your or whatever organization that is, just understand that there are individuals that have been in that unit and they have an experience that you have yet to gain. And so you have to be humble enough just to learn from them. You know, you might have some, you know, the, the uh, college knowledge, but they have, you know, just experience behind them. And so if you go in and you're humble and you're just eager to learn from those individuals, your team is going to grow strong pretty quick. And once you get that team, you know, that, that uh, come right around that team, everything else is going to come together because it's not you being the one that's actually out there executing. Your success is going to come from your team, how successful is your overall team. So you just got to go into it humble enough to learn um, and really understand you know, sometimes if you know your platoon sergeant is going to say, hey, sir or ma'am, let me just explain this to you. And you take it with a grain of salt and you go back and you think about it and you make a decision together as a team. Absolutely. Those are all great points. I would think uh, another great aspect of being a platoon leader that some don't necessarily grasp until they're first lieutenants is uh, influencing beyond the chain of command. Uh, and increasing that presence. So your other platoon leader friends, other lieutenant friends that are in other battalions or even other brigades can uh, greatly increase the number of opportunities that are available for training for your soldiers uh, or for your particular platoon or staff section or whatever because no matter what you're doing, you are commanding your mission. Uh, really mission command, like you don't just have to be a platoon leader, a company commander to be in charge. Uh, so your ability to maintain your readiness on your training and your ability to increase the effectiveness of your team uh, relies heavily upon your ability to provide those opportunities. So seeking out those opportunities, building relationships, but also providing opportunities in turn. So you're, you're a team and you're all working towards like one common goal. So. If you do that earlier on as a second lieutenant, uh, you'll probably show a little bit better amongst your peers, but the, that's like a, a secondary thing. Really just everybody's gonna be better because you're a little bit more energetic and you're a little bit more uh, engaged in making sure that everybody's prepared. Uh, they took all of mine. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So one of the things that you'll learn as a second lieutenant, brand new second lieutenant, um, and that a lot of people are afraid of is taking risk. So as a second lieutenant, you're expected to mess up. Um, and that, that discourages a lot of people. 
um, depending on your company commanders and you know just your leadership. Um, but it's important to get out there as a second lieutenant and get out of your comfort zone and take risk and you know try new things because that's your time to experiment. That's your time to figure out how you're going to be as a leader, um, how you can best um, motivate and influence your soldiers, um, and that kind of shapes you into what you're going to be as an officer. So that, that would be my recommendation is, is get out there and, and take risks. As long as they're um, moral and ethical and you stay within your, your left and right limits, you know, take those risks. You know, do something that you might not normally do. All right, next question. Got one down here. Uh, Cadet Lanier from Bucknell University. Uh, this question's for Captain Kasim. Um, so I'll be going uh, in, as an intel officer. I was hoping you talk about uh, what to expect as an intel officer at the brigade level and what it's like to be an AS2. Uh, great question, and I, I'll try to uh, inform this answer that it can apply to other staff sections as well. Um, first of all, with respect to the non-combat arms branches, if you want to be a leader, you have to really uh, I'm sorry, not a leader, if you want to be a platoon leader, you really have to let your chain of command know that earlier and then jockey for that positioning because in Signal, MI, and a number of other branches, there's only one to two, maximum three slots in each one of these brigade combat teams, and those are pretty coveted slots. So let's say 50% of uh, those particular branches are going to be able to get a platoon leader job, and even, even lesser percentage are even going to get to uh, be a platoon leader next. So a lot of it's determined by luck and timing, but some of it's also determined by how engaged you are, how energetic, and how like what type of attitude you're bringing in addition to your competence. So uh, with respect to platoon leader, make it known very early. But with respect to those staff officer positions, um, because you're still trying to figure out how the Army runs, how to be an officer, how the staff section works. Uh, I think that the best answer, and you're gonna hear this probably with respect to a lot of your questions, is, is just sit back and learn, but don't be afraid to take charge. So, uh, you know, for, as, as an intel officer, if you go to the brigade section, you might be a physical security officer. It sounds small in retrospect uh, uh, or in comparison to everything everybody else is doing, but that's your job. Like if you're a janitor, clean the toilet the best way you can. So be the best physical security officer you can and that will provide more opportunities uh, to do other things because you're building trust and you're filling up your bank account so that you can use some of that later on. Um, and again, that's not just for Intel, that's probably for a number of branches. So uh, outside of just at the brigade level, the, your ability to think critically, um, or I guess outside of those physical security jobs or uh, technical jobs, your ability to think critically and think outside of the box, uh, trying to take other intelligence disciplines and drive that into a uh, recommendation that your commander not only understands, but can also do something about. And that can also apply to every other branch. Don't go to your boss or uh, to anybody with a problem without either identifying a solution or working towards a plan for that solution, asking for a little bit of help. A champion right over there. All right, go ahead, back there. Uh, sir. I'm Cadet Johnson from Florida State University, and a question for the group. So we all have preconceived notions of what life's going to be like as second lieutenants when we commission in, and I was curious, what are some preconceived notions that you all had that you promptly learned were not correct and lessons that you learned from those? Thank you. Uh, all right, I, I guess, I don't know, I think like the, the uh, answer everybody always gets to, oh, what should I do? you know, do with my NCOs is, you know, you need to listen to your platoon sergeant, you know, and I, and I always hated that because that's the answer that we always got. So I wanted to provide something more constructive than just listen to your, your platoon sergeant, okay? So all of you are MS4s, and last year you had to have experience over the summer of camp and uh, attempting to lead your peers. And peer leadership is hard. And I will say that very much like peer leadership, um, leading someone with nine to 13 years of experience as a platoon sergeant is also hard. So you need to take that, uh, 
you know, that notion that I just need to listen to my platoon sergeant and don't throw it out of the window, but you need to take a more of a peer leadership approach to your interactions with your platoon sergeant. So when, when, I, when I talk about that is I say that every decision that happens within your platoon should be a discussion almost with a peer like your, with your platoon sergeant. Just like when I was a company commander, anything that would impact the company, that was a discussion I had with my first sergeant. Because their idea of what uh, should happen is probably different than yours. And that discussion that happens between you two will probably res result in a, a better course of action than you making the decision on your own or he making the decision on your own. Uh, so I think the preconceived notion that I just need to go in and listen to that platoon sergeant uh, would, be, would be different than the reality, is that you need to uh, take a peer leadership uh, approach to it, and especially in terms of things like promotion, discipline, counseling, the things that could have a, uh, you know, that set the tone for that platoon or that organization down the line that you guys need to be together on the whole time. That discussion has to happen. So mine's probably a little different than the answer you're expecting. My experience at West Point was different than yours. We're in a very controlled environment. There, you can't be married, you can't have children, um, and you're, you're just kind of in a prison in a sense. Um, <laughs> And so, I, no, it's, it's actually not that bad, but compared to the experience some of you guys have, it's, it's kind of like a prison. So um, when I stepped from that environment into flight school, I walked into a world of people who had five kids that were coming in from the National Guard, um, people who had lived full lives and had families. And one of the things I struggled with, and I've talked to a lot of cadets at West Point about this, is it was acceptable at West Point for me as a female cadet to hug my male friends who I spent all of my time with because I, there were just more males there than females. That became, it became apparent to me that that was no longer appropriate once I was a lieutenant. Um, how I interacted with my male, not necessarily peers, but counterparts in my organization was under a microscope. Um, and I learned that rather than being uh, upset or, you know, well, just being upset about that, I could just deal with it as the reality that it was and adjust my behavior accordingly. Um, if I didn't adjust my behavior, there were going to be other impacts to my reputation, the organization, um, and ultimately our mission. So I don't know that I realized it was a preconceived notion that I could continue to act the way I had as a cadet, um, but I, I realized quickly that that was something that I wasn't expecting. The way I'd relate that to your ROTC experiences, you know, things like the kind of the kind of stuff you guys post on social media, um, the way you party, the way you interact with the people that you go to school with, um, those aren't necessarily going to be the things that you do when you become an officer, um, because they have impacts on your unit and the mission. So. Uh, the one thing that I would add to it would be just recognize that when you become a platoon leader and you are in that position, you have now became like a mother, a father, sister, and brother to all the, those individuals that are part of your platoon. So, you know, the, some of those individuals are going to be your age, but you cannot hang out with those individuals, and you can't do what they do. You have to begin to mature much quicker if you haven't matured at that point, but then you have to, I guess how I would look at it would be, you have to constantly look down the road on hey, we have this going on, I have this going on in my personal life, and start to prioritize. And you got to focus on developing um, all of those individuals in your, your uh, platoon. I tell the individuals that, the, the cadets at FIU, what I used to look at, and I, I have um, one of my uncles retired as a three-star in the Navy. And so one of the things he used to talk to me about was po uh, positive Ponzi schemes. And so... How I think about that is if you develop four or five people, you know, then those individuals will go out and they will start to develop four or five people and it'll continue so on and so on. But as a platoon leader, if you go into your uh, platoon and you're just, wow, you finally got freedom, that'll never occur. And so your platoon would never have any success. And that's going to have a big impact on the battalion eventually. So you got to go into it and understand that, yes, you, you are a lieutenant now, you have money in your pocket, but now you, are, you have much more responsibility. And that's how you gotta think about things. Every decision you make, 
will have some sort of impact either on your, your uh, platoon, your personal life, or the overall organization. So really just start thinking about that. I think for me, when I commissioned, I was like on top of the world and I'm this lieutenant now and wow, Lieutenant Kasim, man, I'm the best. I'm a platoon leader, I'm gonna be a platoon leader. You know, I, I wanted that mantle responsibility, but I also thought I'm going into an organization that, you know, is as professional maybe as the one I was at or as uh, competent or whatever. No organization or no job or nothing you end up going to will meet like that expectation or that greener pasture idea that you might have. So, you know, when I got to Fort Riley, I was thinking to myself like, man, this is going to be a bunch of Captain Americas and, you know, everything's going to be amazing. And it's not that. I mean, realistically speaking, some people are not going to be as fit. Some people are not going to be as smart or some people are not going to be as driven. But what you have to do is not get frustrated at that situation. Rather, meet your formation where they're at and take them where you want to go. To caveat, though, is if your unit maybe isn't where they're at, it does also does not mean that you are going to keep them there, you know, forever. Because, uh, like Captain Holcomb mentioned, that you know a lot of y'all might not have families, but a lot of your soldiers and your NCOs and uh, your uh, other people that are around you have families. So if you're keeping them there past 1800 for something that maybe could wait until tomorrow, or is a result of your lack of uh, predictability or transparency, then you should probably let them go and you should take the brunt of that hit. Uh, or come in early the next morning to knock out something to make sure that everybody runs smooth sailing either for that day or that week or your training schedule for six weeks. So uh, meet your formation where it's at and where you want it to go and then make sure that you work as hard as you can to maintain some semblance of work-life balance. Yeah, and to continue with that, um, so the family was the biggest aspect that I wasn't um, thinking about when I when I commissioned. So you're used to dealing with your peers, so motivating your peers, everybody's single, everybody has time to do stuff. Um, when you get to your first unit, more, more than half or probably 80 to 90% of your formation will have families. Um, so that's something that you are going to have to deal with. So any, all your actions have a reaction. Um, generally it's from the family. Um, a lot of times it's misinformation or no information flow. Um, so just little things that you can look at to um, get families involved. Um, and then one of the biggest challenges that I faced were, was um, marriages falling apart for, some, for whatever reason. Um, and so me, single uh, Lieutenant Ingram, is counseling a, you know, an E7 who's been married for seven years on, you know, he, he's just having a hard time with, you know, his divorce. And I'm trying to figure out how to talk to him, you know, with no life experience on marriage or, you know, long-term relationships. Um, so just being prepared for the non-expected, because um, you will face a lot of non-expected right. stuff when you are um, a platoon leader. So just being able to talk to people, um, knowing your soldiers, um, that way you know how to encourage them, to get them back on the right track um, so they can be effective, so they can recover, and so they can be um, a good part of for your formation again. So, All right, who's got a next question? Hi, good afternoon. For the last couple of years, we've been learning the importance of different leadership characteristics and attributes. I wanted to ask, in your opinion, what's the most important um, character leader, uh, sorry, characteristic or attribute that a second lieutenant needs to have? All right, we're gonna start with uh, Captain Ingram this time and work our way back to the variety. Don't so, steal mine, I've been going first. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we've, we've mentioned them before, but I would say the eagerness to learn um, so always being open, um, always taking that experience, listening to your NCOs, listening to your peers, so other lieutenants, because other lieutenants have done that job before you, so you know, your, your XO, finding out what they did, um, looking for the best practices, and just not repeating the same stuff that has failed previously. So just looking for um, a better way or a different way to do something. And then the other, actually, I'll, just, I'll leave it at that so everybody can have something to talk about. This isn't one of the like approved competencies or attributes, but I think it aligns with all six. Uh, but empathy and your ability to understand those that around you, not only your subordinates, but your peers, and also your superiors and kind of what they're going through, how you're going to nest in uh, both professionally and personally with what they're trying to do 
and what's going on around you. So I would say just uh, your ability to understand, in addition to like the million other things that makes a phenomenal leader, like a, you know the best PT and all that stuff. But empathy is something I really look for in uh, the people around me. Uh, I would go with uh, probably mental agility and adapt. I would say and being adaptive. Just just be prepared that whatever you plan for, because you get information, you know, coming from top down, it's gonna change at the last minute, and you have to be you know, uh, calm enough and able to just adapt to that situation and be able to transition and still do what you need to do or your platoon needs to do and do it as professional as you can because sometimes some things happen and you put so much work into something and some, someone's gonna come, come through and change that for you and you're probably gonna go home a little, little upset but you'll be okay because you come back to work the next day and you put the same amount of work that you put into that other plan and, and be successful with your, your team. You gonna talk about humility? No, you can Okay. <laughs> I kind of had to. Um, General Evans hit on humility earlier. That's normally the one I always default to and that's because in my career in aviation, I've spent my whole career pretty far behind the people I'm, I'm working alongside as far as experience is concerned and that's just reinforced that I've, I've gotta be humble 100% of the time. Um, and that even if I reach a point where I, I need to step up and take charge, I better not do it from a place uh, or with any other intentions um, other than a hey, mission first and humility on, on my end. But uh, the one that I was gonna talk about that I see from my cadets a lot, and so as you guys transition from cadets to second lieutenants is, sounds kind of corny, but authenticity. So I see a lot of cadets who are, they're quiet people, they're introverts, they're not the loud beat your chest kind of a guy but they're trying to fit into this 6'4", strong-jawed mold that doesn't work. Um, and, and people notice it. And if, if you think cadets notice it or officers notice it, people that will notice it more than anyone are soldiers. So soldiers see right through that stuff. So be you. You can be a quiet, introverted leader. Um, I had a squadron commander who, he, he didn't speak very often, um, and when he did, he was very soft-spoken, but every time he opened his mouth, everybody listened. So just own what you were born with and how you were raised and who you are today, and, and don't try to fit the Army mold, because um, it just won't work. Yeah, I think be yourself, that's a great one. Um, I, so maybe mine's kind of an action, but um, I'd, I'd say building, be able to build trust, all right? So we're a team organization and our ability to build an uh, effective, a highly effective team uh, requires trust. And I think that breaks down into kind of three things that almost everybody's talked about. Um, one, uh, being respectful. Uh, you have people from all walks of life. And if you are unable to identify with each one of those individuals and kind of understand that everyone has a different background, then you're not gonna be able to lead them which does not build trust. So respect comes first, and everybody deserves respect. Uh, and then competence is the next thing. So that, that, and that goes for your job, right? But that goes with communication, all the intangibles. So being competent at your job. Uh, and then the, um, the last thing that I'll talk about there uh, is hard work. Um, so your, your ability to respect everyone uh, be competent in your job, but then work your butt off, uh, and, and that will usually build trust from the subordinate level up, uh, but also from the, uh, the leadership above you, because they understand um, that you're going to get the job done, and you're going to get it done right. All right, next question. <clears throat> Uh, this question is for the whole panel. Um, Cadet Kelly from uh, Louisiana State University. I was going to ask, what are some issues you've noticed or threats that we should be aware of as second lieutenants kind of moving into an army that's moving back to conventional warfare from like within our platoons and from like external threats? I can, I can jump. Go ahead. Let we'll let you start this one. Okay. You're MI yeah, officer. You started. Well, I think, <laughs> I think the, the, the threat comes from, and I think we talked a lot about this during multi domain operations in your last class, is that uh, the complexity uh, has just been ratcheted up. Over the last few years, even, I've just seen the big change of, of more of my platoon need to, need to think about. Um, from down there, he talked about families, just the 
the something, uh, something that could affect your platoon from within or for protect, uh, affect your organization from within or rot it from within is, you know, people have being undisciplined. So that's one thing. But then also the existential threats of, of what you're training for. Uh, you're going to be getting more technology and your ability to manage your personnel uh, and your equipment effectively that everyone's trained on those new pieces of technology that are going to help you win on the modern, modern battlefield. Uh, I think that that kind of just lends itself to how much more you'll have to think about. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody's going to be able to point to like one direct thing, but I think more if it's it's more of a complex environment. And but but also you don't want to overthink it. So as as complicated and complex as multi-domain operations is, like strategic level, graduate level, ILE type stuff that you're going to really start to focus on as a major, probably or senior captain. Uh, as a lieutenant in your individual branch, know your branch. Like everybody should have a baseline understanding of tactics. Um, you know, General Evans spoke about uh, knowing the uh, uh, the Russian enemy during the Cold War, like the back of his hand, understanding the different specifications of different weapon systems and different battle orders. So know your specific mission and as, as an intel officer, as an infantryman or uh, infantry leader or whatever, Whatever you're going to be doing, know your role, but have a general understanding of everything else that can affect it. And to link in with Captain Glass, be adaptable, yeah. because that's what multi-domain operations is. There's so many different things happening that if you manage your part of the pie, then everybody else manages their part of the pie. The pie is a pie. Uh, it's a bad, you know, no laughs. Got it. Not a funny group. Not a good joke, <laughs> we're okay. Uh, but if you manage your particular portion um, and maintain an ability to be adaptable, then I think you're gonna be very successful. And so, I'm okay. So I'm a, I, I, what I would hit on with, coming off of what he said was, you definitely gotta understand your branch, your job. But the one thing that I would tell you is where you need to try to learn as much as you can about those other branches, especially as a lieutenant, and you know, so what I look at is my time as a lieutenant, I, I, being in the 82nd, I'm, I'm wondering why do I, my first job need to be um, an XO in the FSC in the infantry battalion. And so what I look at is from all those crazy jobs I had, I was a platoon leader, but when I um, went into command, I understood, you know, logistics well. I understood intel doing that in, in uh, Ramadi, Iraq as a, the OIC. And so when I got to Poland, and I'm, you know, I'm spending as much time talking to the S, the S2. I didn't like tanks at that point because I just loved jumping out of airplanes. And I went to 166 Armory in um, Fourth ID, and I under, I started to really just study tanks. When we went to Poland, and then we got the opportunity to really look at what the Russians were able to do. All of that stuff started to make sense. You got to understand your job. You got to understand what the inf uh, infantrymen does what the fires, the armor, how, how all of that stuff ties together. Because once you get out there and you're really training or you get into this, this new battlefield area that we're going into, everyone has to work together. You have to be able to talk their lingo and you have to understand how they operate and the things that you can add to, to them so that the overall brigade or division can be successful. So, you know, what I would tell you, urge you all to do is try to study as much material as you can and respect other branches and how can I add to that branch because you're going to support one another. I'm going to jump on his comment about studying. So when you first asked that question, I didn't really have an answer. Um, when you go out and you become a second lieutenant, you're going to be, you're going to have tunnel vision, you're gonna be looking through a soda straw at, like you're gonna be dealing with range control and doing DTMS or whatever that system's called now, and you're gonna be doing all this crap that consumes all of your time and all of this kind of strategic thinking that we're, we're doing and talking about this week is, is gonna be in the past. And the only way you're gonna get back to that is by doing your own study. And the way that, that I found to do that is I made friends with all the Intel nerds and I would just go pick their brains all the time. Uh, yep. So um, I found uh, quality news sources where I could continue to understand what was going on in the world, and then I would link in with those intel guys and understand all the different threats that were out there and 
Um, I would get to read some of the things that they were reading um, on a classified system, and that's how I kind of stayed um, in tune with what was going on when I was in the middle of doing this. Well, I believe everybody's touched on everything, but I'll say so start small. So until you figure out what, what it is you're doing and what your job is, um, there's no point in look, I mean, there is a point, but there's no point in trying to just completely eat the entire pie. So start small, start <laughs> with your funny. piece. I mean, it's a good, that's good. So start with your piece. Once you get that mastered, then bite off more chunks and keep, keep learning, keep looking for new information. Um, and then eventually the Army will mold you into a strategic, strategic thinking leader. So. All right, next question. Yeah. Cadet Lombardozzi from Christopher Newport University. So obviously there's importance on building trust with your platoon and understanding your soldiers, but what are ways outside of military training to really build that team cohesion without crossing that line of building too close of friendships or just deeming inappropriate in general as an officer? All right, for this one, we'll let uh, Captain Glass and uh, Captain Cummings Okay. So, um, so there's there's event you know events that you can do and and, and maybe Kevin Glass will go is maybe that's a lot of lines but I'll try to get a little bit more philosophical with you or the actions that you can take. Um, part of being the authentic leader uh, and and connecting with those individuals that may not have the same background. Oh, and you're being a lieutenant, so they already know that you're a lieutenant and they don't want to talk to you anyway is just being able to communicate to different levels. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is that you need to understand who your audience is at any time. If you're talking to the whole platoon, you're gonna talk a different way than you're gonna talk to if you have your squad leaders in the room. Or if, if you have, oh, you know, if you're, if you're talking in closed door with your platoon sergeant, you're gonna be more like a peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, kind of friend type conversation unless it needs to, you know, go differently. But what I'll say is that if, if you have the ability to communicate differently or to, when you interact with those lowest level privates, that they understand what you're saying and you're not just that robotic lieutenant that kind of gives the, yeah, I'm a lieutenant answer. I, I think that will go a long way in them kind of identifying with you too as just another soldier, all right? So yeah, I think you're, you're worried about crossing the line of seeing them out in public or, or things like that. And, and that might happen. You might be at the same place as, as, right. as your, um, you know, soldiers, and, and it's okay. It's just you have to re react appropriately to that situation, um, and, and that's going to take some time. And certain things you're going to get the experience, but that's what I would say. I'd offer that you know you talk to those things about to NCOs. You talk to the about things like that to your company commander. Hey, how how would you handle this situation? Because there is a lot of ifs. But I would say is my biggest thing: be able to communicate to each level within within you know the chain of command. Mm. What I would say, uh, definitely trying to build that team, you got to invest. If you invest in, like, each individual in your uh, platoon, trying to get to know them, understand the things they like, yeah. understanding things about their family, understanding where they're from. You know, I'm a country boy from Mississippi, so, you know, anytime I meet someone, I'm constantly trying to learn as much about them because I know what my upbringing is, and now I kind of want to understand what their upbringing is, and I know how to converse with those individuals, um, and we can develop a better uh, relationship. The other thing I would, would say would, would be building your team, just you know, try to do some group outings. Do something as a, a team together. You know, I'm not a, a person that drink. You know, if I drink, it's going to be protein, BCAA, <laughs> you know, because I, I like to stay in the gym. You know, but try to look at things such as that. How can I do something to build this team? And in the end, it's not going to be detrimental. And when you walk away from it, it's your, rep uh, your reputation tainted. You know, that's what I think about. So invest in, in each individual. Try to help them grow. And so when it's time to communicate with them, it, it'll be easier to communicate with them. You know, and because they are beginning to get to know you and you know everything about them and you know how to convey information to different individuals. Yeah, that's that empathy that uh, was talked about earlier. Absolutely. That 
if, if, if he's married with two kids and you're married with two kids, like you already have things that are common to you. And being able to bring those out and just passing discussions, that creates another connection. People start to feel safe around you and that trust can go a long way. All right, so like, like Captain Glass said, start identifying those things with everybody in your formation that you have similarities with and that empathy and that kind of those connections will follow. All right, next question. Uh, Cadet Gisha, Michigan State University. Uh, what is one time in your Army career that you failed, and how did you learn from it? I will let uh, Captain Holcomb take this one. I probably need a second, sir. I got a failure story. I got a bunch of them. So sure. if you, if you, if you want to hear more, we can talk later. When I was a company commander, I just started, and I put together this plan, and it was a, like a it was going to be an exercise for both my platoons where uh, I had a medical platoon and a chemical platoon. And I leveraged the Charlie Medical Company at the brigade level to support my medical platoon. But there was a, the only like chemical resource we had was a chemical officer at the brigade level. I didn't have a good relationship with him and I just thought I could do it on my own. So it was like a four day exercise where they built upon different tasks and the culminating exercise for that chemical platoon just didn't hit the mark and it didn't get what we wanted to. And if I would have asked the brigade chem officer, it was something so easy that he would have been able to identify you should do something different and it would have been a successful mission. So we're doing the AAR, it's myself, my XO and my first sergeant with the chemical platoon leader and platoon sergeant, we're talking through it and then they leave and I just, I felt like a little bad. I just didn't feel really like positive and I'm a pretty positive person. And I, my XO, super confidant with me. And I just, I said, sir, why don't we do it again? Uh, you know, step eight retrain. And I was like, you know what? Absolutely. And it's eight o'clock at night. So I went to the platoon leader, asked him if that's something that he wanted to do. It would have had to be uh, that night at 11.30 midnight, we called the chem officer. He gladly came in from home to come and fix the issue. Um, and <laughs> I think we finished training at 3 a.m. and then woke up the next morning at five to support the medical platoons culminating exercise. But I learned a really valuable lesson that not, like I can't do it on my own. I gotta maintain those relationships even if we don't necessarily have a lot in common. And I can't be afraid to ask others for help, to include somebody who's subordinate to me. My XO, I mean, that was like a soothing sound, like, sir, it's okay, you know, let's just do it again. And that was really helpful. And it turned out to be really great and the platoon loved it. Um, you know, everybody's a little tired, but you don't always get the opportunity to train, especially with all the resources, time and focus that it takes to put something together like that. Um, so failure, but it turned out to be really great because, you know, we identified that it was a failure. So unfortunately, I don't have a like an epic failure story. Um, my career has been more little failures all along the way than one big one. Um, and it, the common theme in all of mine is, um, my, to me, one of my better qualities is also one of my worst qualities, and it's my candor. Um, and so my failures all throughout my career have been times where I felt so strongly, it, it's going back to his comment about emotion, where I felt so strongly about something and I felt that I knew what was right um, and that no one else in the room wanted to speak up because they didn't want to upset the boss, they didn't want to you know, stir the pot, whatever the reason was, I felt like I knew best and if I just spoke my mind, maybe, maybe things would change. Um, and a lot of times it was good for me to speak my mind, um, but in a lot of cases I, I don't want to say I destroyed relationships, but I compromised some, some working relationships that would help me and my organization in the future. So um, one thing that I've learned multiple times over and that I continue to learn is um, understanding when I should be candid, how I should be candid. Because you can be candid, but you can craft your words carefully enough that you don't, that you don't destroy uh, relationships or burn bridges. I don't know if that makes sense. All right, next question. Uh, Cadet Smith from West Virginia State University. 
My question is for individuals that are going into the reserve component, National Guard and the reserve, uh, the things we've talked about this evening, what advice would you have for us officers to build trust and to work for our soldiers if we're only seeing them one week in a month and only working with them two weeks out of the year? Who wants that one? Uh, I'll talk that a little bit. So um, you're going to hear a lot throughout your Army career of the total force uh, and how we leverage the total force to be successful uh, as an Army and, and really as an armed forces. And, and what I'll say is that um, I don't envy those leaders within the Reserve uh, and National Guard component because where I work, uh, I work with a few people that are in the National Guard and Reserves, and a lot of the time I hear the same soldier issues that I experienced as a lieutenant and as a company commander, and they're trying to deal with those in the middle of their civilian job. Um, so a kid going AWOL or a kid getting a DUI, guess what? You are doing that same thing when I would have the whole week to deal with it, person to person, face to face, but you are trying to talk to your commander, and talk to your uh, subordinate chain of command, um, geographically separated. Um, so, the, so the big thing is that I would say is that uh, when you do have your time on the weekend or at your annual training, um, that you maximize that, that, uh, the, that opportunity. Maybe just don't do the things that have been scripted for you to do on those weekends that are, hey, we're just going to the range this weekend. What else can you do during those limited time that you have that formation in front of you uh, to build those relationships. And that's what I've seen work, is that when then when you get that phone call from somebody and they're talking to you, you know you have a little bit more of a connection than just, hey, this guy is saying that this is going on. Because it, 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 could, be a, it could be a really, it could be a really complicated situation. It could be, uh, you know, a behavioral health issue that, and if you don't know that soldier, then you don't really know what he's going through or he or she is going through. So what I would say is just maximize your time when you have it uh, and, and really show, show you care during those, those instances. All right, we have time for one more question. This is for Captain Cummings. Um, is there anything that you wish you knew uh, or were better at before going to infantry bowl like ranger school or uh, your platoon leader time? Um, I mean, this is probably similar to a lot of people because a lot. I mean, it's not just an uh, uh, infantry thing. Um, so, I wish I had a better appreciation for the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're going in right now uh, and saying, "I'm going to get a platoon, or I'm going to do this, and uh, you know, I'm going to make the best of it, and we're going to be the best platoon, or, or whatever like this." But as a company commander, the lieutenants that did the best, they understood that they were part. Uh, of a bigger organization. Um, and the, the lieutenants that did the worst or I had the most problem with were always only concerned about their platoon. Mm -hmm. um, so what I would say is, is that, yeah, when you go to Bullock and when you do ranger school and everything like that, try to take leadership lessons away, uh, you know, and do all those things that are hard individual tasks and, and be successful at them. But as soon as you step into an organization, you have to understand uh, that it is more than just you and your platoon. Mm -hmm. um, because more and more, you have to be successful in, at, at not only the company level, but the battalion level. Because uh, at the, on decisive action rotations now at JRTC, your platoon is now going to be counted on to do more than it has been in the past. Um, and they're going to expect you to understand the commander's intent and take that forward to be successful. Um, so I wish I had a greater appreciation for uh, the bigger picture um, because I think I would have been better uh, faster. And then the only other thing I would say is that um, a lot of people think that you need to be a platoon leader immediately or if you don't get a platoon, um, you know, it's, it's some sort of uh, detractor. I wish I had a better appreciation for the staff officer. I've learned more as a staff officer than I have as a platoon leader or company commander. And I've gotten more out of my time in the Army and be able to think critically when I was in staff than I did uh, in leadership roles as a platoon leader or a company commander. 
And I think all of you need to understand that when you're in a staff role, um, that, that you have a bigger impact on the organization as a whole than if you were just a, in a platoon leader position, all right? So don't take it lightly um, and understand that every interaction that you have, you're gonna have more interactions with senior leaders when you're on staff and you have to take every single one of those instances uh, as a learning experience. Uh, that's what I got. Can I, can I add on Yeah, go ahead. That? So with what I just heard from him, what I think about is um, when you are on staff, I would say just embrace it. You have, he, he's talking about understanding the big picture. When you're working as, as staff as a second lieutenant, you have an opportunity to learn every company within that battalion. You have every opportunity to understand the capabilities because, you know, as a lieutenant, you might just be focused on whatever your branch is. But once you begin to understand that this battalion does, let's say they are capable of completing this mission, and you understand that each platoon has a viable part to that mission, and then you begin to develop those relationship with each individual in every company. When you go be a platoon leader, it's gonna be that much more easier because you can go talk to the, the, uh, another lieutenant in another company. You can go talk to, you know, my favorite people to talk to is the logisticians because you never know what they have up their sleeve. <laughs> it's like, whatever, as an engineer, if I need something, I know that if I go talk to them, they probably can help me. And in the end, I know that I can go help somebody else. And the biggest thing is just develop those relationships and understand that your success is going to come from being a team player. You know, if you do your part, the company is going to be successful. If the company commander work well with the other company commanders, the battalion is going to be successful. So go on staff, learn as much as you can, the ins and outs, so when you get out there, and the coach puts you in the game, you're able to go ahead and run that play the way that it should be. And if someone has to, you know, make a change, when the snap comes, you can reverse and still win the game. And that's how I look at it, you know, from a, a sense of being an athlete. You know, you have to be able to, you know, just adapt to every situation. I think being on, on uh, staff kind of lets you see the, the big playbook so that you're not just focused on what that platoon or that company does because you can execute in multiple ways and, and help the, the battalion or brigade win, so. Don't be the platoon leader that <coughs> whines with his soldiers about the staff. <laughs> it's real easy to do. Everybody, says, oh, the staff screwed up, the staff messed this up, the staff dropped that, and you're like, yeah, they must suck, and you just sit there and run your mouth the whole time you're a platoon leader and, or you're down there in the company, and then you walk into that staff role and you're like, man, that's a tough job. The company's <laughs> messed up. It's not us. It's the company. And so when I, when I took command of a headquarters company, I went from being the person whining at the company level to watching my, my soldiers on the staff whine about the companies. And I'm sitting yeah. here going, what are we doing? We're both whining about each other, and we're not communicating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're not understanding why the staff struggles to complete this task. The staff's not understanding how busy the company is and how hard it is to get whatever inf information they need to push back to the staff. So... Communication helps, um, and not pretending you understand what that yeah. what that staff or what that person in the company is going through. So, because you'll end up feeling like a fool once you're in that position. Uh, first off, Captain Glass, better analogy with the football playbook than the pie. Uh, there he we go. There's the last. Uh, <laughs> but with respect to going to Bolick, getting your unit, or a number of other things. Uh, an MS1 lesson where you talk about goal setting is extremely appropriate here. You're not expected to know too much going into your unit, the exception of being physically fit and uh, being willing to learn and being energetic, positive, etc. But if you have an action plan about your own professional development, not just with respect to uh, your branch, but other elements of being an officer, other elements of uh, different domains that I think were touched on earlier from General Evans, where, uh, you know, social domain, uh, professional, spiritual, physical, um, you know, academic. There's, there's a number of areas that you can improve, but only if you have a plan and you attach timeline onto that plan and it's specific, difficult, and proximate enough to allow you to achieve those like measured goals. So uh, with respect to preparing, just identify what those priorities are and set goals to achieve them. Well, let's jump back to uh, staff work. So one of the things that I learned was staff work was hard. So when I thought platoon leadership was hard, 
staff is hard because as being on staff, you are there to support the company. And a lot of times, um, because you know, you'll, you'll be on battalion staff or brigade staff, you kind of forget that because you're at, a, you know, you're at a higher level. But when you think about it, the staff is there to support the company. Um, and once you realize that, and once you realize that you're gonna be putting in more work so the company has more time to accomplish their mission and accomplish their training, and you, you pass that down to your subordinates, um, hopefully by the time you become a company commander, the staff will respect you um, so in kind. So when you get that company command, um, the staff will be working for you rather than you working for the staff, so. But also pass Ranger School. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, join me in thanking the panel for today. Thank you. Thank you.